Every year, the North American International Auto Show is the first major event on the car industry calendar. All the major car makers descend on Detroit. Detroit is totally on vogue again. It's really vital as we're very successful in the U.S. It kickstarts the year for the auto industry. It has a really high status because at the fair, we see what the competition is doing. Mercedes is making a big splash here. Selected industry fairgoers from around the world are being treated to a sneak preview of the new CLA class. The CLA is based on the platform of the new A-Class, so the wheelbase is the same. But this sporty and dynamic four-door coupe is treading new territory, too. Mercedes-Benz is presenting the revamped E-Class in four body configurations. The coupe, the convertible, sedan, and station wagon. The E63 AMG is especially sporty. The five new E-Class models here are paving the way for Mercedes' 2020 growth strategy, explains Daimler's R&D head. Volkswagen also set out to impress, previewing a new SUV generation called the Cross Blue. It's been specifically designed with the North American market in mind. A third row of seats means up to seven people can sit comfortably in the five meter long cross blue. VW is here because America needs new mobility, says CEO Martin Winterkorn. VW wants to offer customers an individual kind of mobility. Lexus is breaking new ground, too. The Japanese company celebrates the world premiere of the new IS, with which it's hoping to win important market shares. The distinctive radiator grille is the new hallmark of all new Lexus models, in a move to boost brand identity. From the side, you recognize the rear seats are set way back. The short tail is dominated by wide taillights. The role of the IS is to uh, attract more more and more younger buyers because the Lexus uh, customers are uh, getting older and older year by year. So we are now uh, rejuvenated the brand image of Lexus itself, more attractive brand for the younger people. BMW is showcasing the Z4. The M version of the 6 Series Grand Coupe and the new I models. But there's more. Detroit also saw the global debut of the 4 Series Coupe concept. BMW executive Herbert D says it's a very sporty vehicle with a distinctive presence. He predicts it'll be one of this year's big hits. The Series 4 Coupe is an evolutionary step on from the 3 Series sedan but as such, an all-new creation. It's almost seven centimeters flatter than the three series and longer and wider too. An extravaganza of magic and dance presents a suitable backdrop for the world premiere of the new Audi RS7. This model aims to appeal to Americans interested in powerful engines. That said, US speed limits mean the powerful 412 kilowatt engine can't be used to its full potential. It's a model designed to impress. But will that be enough to prevail on the American market? The American market is a strategic one for Audi, says CEO Rupert Stadler. The car maker already became the number one luxury marquee in China and Europe. In the US, he's confident Audi has one up on the competition. One sports car that's always been a hit on the American market is the Porsche. The German specialist is presenting the powerful Cayenne Turbo S for the first time. With a 405 kilowatt engine, it's the most powerful production SUV in the world. Porsche managed to reduce the weight by 140 kilos, explains CEO Matthias Müller. That also meant cutting fuel consumption and CO2 emissions by 25%. 
In his eyes, it elevates the overall Cayenne range. Chevrolet are keen to promote engine power. The seventh edition of the iconic Corvette has an output of 335 kilowatts and also proudly bears the legendary badge Stingray. Two drivers, two cars, and one mission to cross Germany on the Autobahn from Denmark all the way down to Austria. Dirk Leutz is a driving instructor who normally drives a 367 kilowatt Mercedes. He wants to put the pedal to the metal. Ralph Müller is a driving instructor and fuel economy expert. He'll be driving at only 130 kilometers an hour. Theoretically, Dirk should be able to use the test car's top speed of 210 kilometers per hour to cover the 1,000 kilometer route three hours quicker. Approaching the German border, the two drivers are neck and neck. Denmark, like practically every other country on the planet, has speed limits. Once over the border, though, Dirk pulls ahead. He's determined to drive fast at the few opportunities available. Over 90% of Germany's roads have speed limits, complains the car lobby, but that includes country roads and city streets. Focusing on autobahns, however, and excluding temporary roadworks, that figure drops to 50%. Ralph is happy to stick to 130 kilometers per hour. 130 is not too fast, but definitely not too slow, a comfortable speed. And also, says Ralph, it's a far safer speed. Dirk insists that safety is determined by the driver and not the speed. 130? He needs to hit 200 to be really awake. Although he admits that extra speed means you have to be more focused. Is driving faster more dangerous? No, says the car lobby, pointing to the crash statistics in countries with more comprehensive speed limits. Our investigation includes a visit to the Hildesheim Highway Police. With 336 clicks on the clock, Dirk is 20 minutes ahead. There used to be no speed limit on this stretch of the A7. Not anymore. They have a long two-lane section limited to 120 kilometers an hour, explains the police spokesman. They monitored the situation three years before the change in 2008 and three years afterwards. The total number of accidents on the Autobahn there decreased by 18%. When it came to minor injuries, the figure fell by over 50 percent. One nil for speed limits. Both drivers continue at 120 kilometers an hour. Dirk is frustrated, but his rival is happy to concentrate on saving fuel. Ralph had to brake four times due to other vehicles joining the road. He keeps a decent distance to minimize his braking. He says braking is a waste of energy, and getting back that energy is expensive later at the gas pump. Meanwhile, Dirk has to slow down. There's traffic on the approach to Frankfurt. Sticking to the preset route would lose him time. Dirk prefers to take a 25-kilometer detour where he can drive faster, but he's losing both time and money. To ensure they cover the same route, Ralph takes the same detour, even though the traffic is clearing. A clear penalty for him, but he overtakes Dirk. Dirk is still filling up. Dirk is soon back in front. But at what cost to his wallet and the environment? We consult the German environmental authorities. After 727 kilometers, Dirk has a half-hour lead. Researchers here monitor air pollution. Driving at higher speeds translates into disproportionately higher emissions. It can mean fuel consumption rising by something like 50 percent, explains our expert. It's due to the massive influence of aerodynamic resistance at high speeds. In our test, the faster driver guzzles around 30 percent more fuel. Looking at the entire route, Dirk admits his time wasn't that much better. But still, he says he was faster.
But at much greater cost, of course. Exactly. Higher speeds mean more accidents and higher costs. Dirk does need less time for the journey, even if he has to slow down repeatedly. It's pretty heavy traffic with a lot of roadworks and a lot of speed restrictions. It's possible that he won't reach the destination much sooner than Ralph, he adds. Does driving faster actually get you places faster? And does slowing down from a speed of 200 cause tailbacks? We visit the Neu Ulm University of Applied Sciences to find out. After 1,009 kilometers, Ralph is 46 minutes behind. The university's staff includes a specialist for traffic research. He has clear views on the speed limit issue. He likes to drive fast himself. But what about the scientific perspective? The graph shows the respective speeds and the number of cars the road can hold. The ideal figure is at just under 100 kilometers an hour. Knapp 100 km/h ein Optimum. Da sind also die meisten Autos auf der Straße unterzubringen. So even slower than 130. Yes. And there's an additional effect. When your speed changes because the car in front slows down, you tend to brake harder. So in turn, does the car behind you. It's a classic way for a tailback to develop. More accidents, higher fuel consumption and more tailbacks, thanks to people driving fast. All Dirk has gained is some extra time. Ralph continues at 130 kilometers an hour, hoping to make it on a single tank of fuel. The car says he has a remaining range of 110 kilometers. The sat-nav, however, says he has 111 kilometers to go. It's going to be close. Air cut off, reduce speed, and use the slipstream. That involuntary 25-kilometer detour outside Frankfurt because of Dirk is now proving fateful. The remaining mileage is now zero. And then, at 90 kilometers an hour, a minor miracle. What happened? He drove so efficiently that the computer recalculated and now displays a range of five kilometers. He makes it to the destination. 1,115 kilometers and one tank of gas. In the end, Dirk arrived 64 minutes earlier, but he guzzled 110 liters of fuel as opposed to Ralph's 70 liters. That translates into a whopping 70 euros more. The guys then switch to a cheaper and greener form of transportation. The new Mazda 6 is the second product from the Japanese car maker to incorporate its new design philosophy, known as Kodo. The car's sweeping contours create different color effects depending on how the light hits it. Unusually, the wagon version is shorter than the sedan. That's because the former is destined for the European market, while the sedan will be hitting showrooms right across the world. Audi presents its latest innovation, a driverless car. Between 0 and 60 kilometers an hour, the computer takes over, just like an autopilot system in a plane. The technology aims to take the strain off drivers in jams and slow moving traffic. When the road ahead clears, the system warns the driver to take control of the wheel again. Audi is now testing the system on the streets of Las Vegas. Hyundai has revamped its i20 to keep up in the highly competitive small car segment. The biggest changes come at the front. The i20 now features the company's new hexagonal grille. Besides the design tweaks around the hood, underneath there's a new economical diesel engine, designed and developed at Hyundai's development plant in Rüsselsheim, Germany. Let's take a look. The i20 small diesel engine is only a three-cylinder, 1.1-liter unit, says Matis. It's a practice known in the trade as downsizing, and it gives the car a really fruity sound. Extrem kernigen sound. 
But but considering the throaty exhaust, Matus expected the engine to be a bit more responsive. It can take a while for it to pick up speed. But having said that, he still thinks it's a peppy little motor. What about space in the back? Is the trunk as small as the engine? Matis fills us in on the dimensions. The I-20 boasts 295 liters of cargo space with the seats up. Put them down and pack the trunk roof high, and that figure rises to 1,060 liters. For a car this size, Matis is impressed. But he isn't impressed with the choice of materials back here. The materials on the back of the seats and the tray could be better, but they do the job. The abdeckung vom Boden, das könnte alles ein bisschen hochwertiger sein, aber es erfüllt seinen Zweck. Matas takes us into the cabin. Here's the wheel. And the seats in the front and back. He says they're comfortable and the driving position is also good. The dash is a bit of a letdown. From a distance, it looks nice, but this car has a strange two-tone dash. Matis isn't a fan at all, but he does like the keyless start. All he has to do to bring the engine to life is press the start button. With the engine purring, it's time to see how the car behaves out on the open road. The I-20 goes from 0 to 100 in 15.7 seconds and maxes out at 158 kilometers an hour. Over a 100 kilometer stretch, the Hyundai burns 3.2 liters of gas. We think everyday consumption will realistically be more like 4.5 liters. But compared to the competition, that's still a decent showing. As Matas said before, the engine needs a bit of time to gain momentum. Its sweet spot is around two and a half to 3,000 revs per minute, and it's okay once you're in that range. Of course, you can't expect too much from a 55 kilowatt engine. But for a small car like this, it's sufficient. Matis finds the I-20 stick shift box easy to operate. The gears are close together, so it's no hassle moving up and down through the cogs. The 1.1 liter CRDI that he's driving has a six-speed transmission. The steering is full of feeling and isn't too firm. Mata says it's also set up for easy parking in town. The I-20 has plenty of gadgets depending on the equipment level. Matas points out the optional reverse parking camera that shows you in the mirror what's behind. It's easier for him to see how much space is behind by looking in the mirror rather than by glancing through the rear window. Another hit with Matas is the steering wheel. It puts everything you need during a journey right at your fingertips. He can adjust the cabin temperature and operate the radio. He can even answer calls without taking his hands off the wheel. Everything is automatic, says Matis. The headlights go on automatically, and so too do the wipers. A couple of years ago, these features were inconceivable in a car like this. But not anymore. These are all plus points, says Matis, when you're on long journeys. His only gripe is the seats. There's a crossbeam at the bottom that keeps digging into his back, so he's not sitting very comfortably. What's the final word on the little Hyundai? The I-20 isn't a pocket rocket, says Matis, and he wouldn't like to travel long distances in it. But the car wasn't built for that. It's the sort of model he would use for getting to work if he lived in the city or in the suburbs or for doing the shopping. The trunk is certainly big enough and that makes the i20 a success for its makers. We heard there was a one-of-a-kind car in town. 
So we arranged to meet up with the man behind it and his friends in a local pub. Our man Torsten Link manages to track down Bernhard Kremann. But before they can hit the road in his BMW stretch limo, he insists they first have to finish their game. It's time to head on out. For years, the unique six-door limo has served as a reliable runaround for Bernhard Skittles Club. It's the perfect car to turn up to tournaments in. The opposition never failed to be intimidated. Bernhard likes to reminisce with his friends about the limo. He says he built her all of 20 years ago. The car providing the front was built in 1984, so it was eight years old back then. And the one in the back? It was even older. <laughs> Bernhard lets us take a closer look at his exclusive creation. He used to work as a mechanic at BMW, so he knew from the start that the sturdy 7 Series was the perfect car for the job. Still, it took him two years of tinkering to join two of them together. The finished article is nearly 5.8 meters long. Our man Torsen asks how he did it. Did he just join two cars together? Well, not quite, says Bernhardt. He took two cars, one of them damaged at the front, the other damaged at the rear, and stretched them before joining them together right here. He didn't just weld them, but put a rebar across the floor to strengthen it. But Torsen doesn't remember ever seeing a 7 Series with an extra set of doors like this one. Bernhard explains how he did it. It's apparently quite simple, really. The front half of the middle car is actually from the back door. And the back half of the middle door is the back part of the front door. He joined them together in the middle, and made another one for the other side. It was no easy feat by any stretch of the imagination, but the result is probably the longest BMW in the world. The 20-year-old limo is over half a meter longer than the current 7 Series, but that creates some problems out on the road. No doubt you have to pay special attention when behind the wheel here, says Torsten. It must get tight in multi-story car parks. Bernhard never uses them. There's just not enough room. In parking lots and on tight corners, the car swings out. It drives differently to big standard road cars, he says. Because of that, the limo has come with its challenges. It was also an uphill battle getting it certified street legal to begin with. Bernhardt was quoted upwards of 10,000 Deutschmarks to get the car registered, but he managed to find an approved engineer who would do it cheaper. He had to take a closer look at the rear axle, but then gave the green light. It cost 400 Deutschmarks. Had it flunked, Bernhardt would have had to part company with his beloved limo before ever even driving it on the open road. Bernhard takes us into his garage to show us around his collection of cars and motorcycles. This one here still works, he says. He bought it from a runner-up in the World Off-Road Sidecar Championships. He still rides it today with a friend who he started with when he was 14. They still ride like men possessed, even though they're both grandpas. At 54 years old, Bernhard is proud that the youngsters can't keep up with him around the dirt track. Even he sometimes bites the dust, but that's a price he's willing to pay to take home some silverware. The BMW limousine is currently up for sale and carries a 10,000 euro price tag. Bernhard hasn't had any serious bidders yet, but that doesn't bother him and his friends. They're more than happy to hang on to the old girl. <laughs>